Raga the KK, who is in fact an artist. He is an example of what Jeffrey Ernstoff was talking about last night, the symptoms of art. He himself is that. And Kunal Sood, who, if you've been with Twin, you know Kunal. He's a global connector, a great friend, former student, and now I must say I've learned much from him as well. So if we have been able to get them on the screen from India, there they are, Kunal. And uh, oh. Raghava, how are you? Wonderful, Rob. Thank you for having me there. Great. Uh, well, Kunal, thanks so much for all you do, including introducing us to Raghava maybe a decade ago. I, uh, you're right, almost a decade ago. A decade right. ago is when right. I met you in my first year. And 2013 is when I brought the Indian caravan in as you enjoyed putting it in Kins yes. 2013. Yes, it was wonderful. Well, uh, Kunal, thanks so much for all you do for us. And we're so sorry you couldn't be here with us. You came down with a hopefully mild case of COVID. Well, relatively mild, not so mild. I've been uh, under, I ghosted for about two weeks. And, you know, it, it got me thinking. I was so excited. Rob, you were going to be my first ever in-person speech slash summit in two and a half years. And feel this is like my 50th damn summit on a virtual plane, which I'm like, okay, right. including 25 that I did. So I well, really if planned ahead. You could have actually done a dance on the screen. Let's not I know. Remember, there. I said, if, I, if all else fails, because we know that it's a sometimes AI is easier than AV. We yeah, just yeah. started ballroom dance and that would be talked about probably even more than the Will Smith situation. Room. And and somewhat disconcerting, too. But there you go. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> Kunal, thanks, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I hope to see you in person here next year and then also in India. I'll be in Bangalore in July, perhaps, and maybe even Mumbai, perhaps we can connect. Yeah, there. yeah, and, and next time we might even be able to do what we decided to do, let's talk about convening. Yes, you know, convening. And how the future of convening Should will... we call uh, it Twindia? Disrupt. Twindia would be yeah, great. All right, all right. Tough crowd, you know. jeez. That's Green okay, don't worry. I'm Great. not politically so, correct at all. Kunal, so. um, I'm going to give there's a little Raghava. bit of feedback behind you. Okay. We're going to say gonna goodbye Raghava. and we're okay. going to have a conversation with your friend Raghava about his art and about the concept of transcend. I'm going to give Raghava a big hug and you as well and all the kin, twin family, kin to twin, twin to whatever next. Yeah. And see Great. you in the metaverse. Thanks, Kunal. Great. Thanks, Thanks, guys. Kunal. Bye, everyone. So, Raghava, welcome back. Thank you, Rob. Not at all. Where are you now? I'm in Bangalore, India, in my studio home. Yes. Great. So I hope to see you in mid-July if you happen to be around. Well, we're working. I out. look forward so, to that. So I'd like to start with a question for you about our theme. What okay. does transcend mean to you? And I know, by the way, I know this is a project, Raghava, that you've been working on uh, for a bit. So you've thought quite a bit about this. What does transcend mean to you? Could I answer that with a very short story, Rob? Am I allowed to say no? Yes. <laughs> please, please do. <laughs> you know, I was seven years old. Casually, my dad passing me my dinner he says, Raghava, who are you? I said, Pa, I'm Raghava. He said, but I named you. So if I change your name, will you change? I said, no. He said, who are you? I said, I'm this person, this person in front of you. He said, that person, every cell changes every seven years. You're completely a new person. So who are you? So existential crisis, Rob, was part of my dinner uh, every day. Dinner. The staple diet. Wow, so when I was watching Fred Rogers, you were having an existential crisis. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No America's and, in decline. <laughs> and then we end we end the evening by me just frustrated with that. Everything that I thought I was, I realized is changing. So we come to the conclusion that evening that we're all storytellers. And then he asked me something that really, uh, really struck me. He said, if you're storytellers, can you live the best story you can tell? So I see my life 
as an art form, as a narrative being told real time. And transcendence, uh, you were asking me about transcendence. You know, I want to point to this word in Sanskrit called jiva, which means to be alive. But when literally translated, it means the hunger. And what, what is this hunger for? The hunger to grow, to go beyond oneself, to transcend. So when we, my brother Karthik Kalyan Raman, economist, and I worked together, we came up with the definition of transcendence. We said that across all religions, cults, uh, self-help books, we realized that transcendence has three emotions. One is loss. Second is liberation. And the third is mystery. A part of you dies. I went through divorce recently, and a part of me died. And I thought I had to experience that loss to transcend. And then there was liberation, because now I'm not dating her. I can date anybody. So there was a sense of liberation there. And I had to focus on all three, because the mystery was, what am I going to end up becoming? And I don't know. Can I accept that? <clears throat> yeah. And then what about mystery? So mystery is actually the toughest of both because it's easy for us to experience loss or focus on ridiculous success or liberation. The mystery part is where art, the art part of it comes in. When we learn to abstract things and understand things through abstraction, where you also realize that the future is unknowable. And only when you accept that it's unknowable will you discover things you never thought were possible. And that was a mouthful. I'd, I'd love for each of us to reflect today on these three notions of loss, liberation, and mystery, and how those relate to the notion of transcendence. And we'll come back to that. So one of the things I love about you, Raghava, is that you're not just a phenomenal artist, and you are. And by the way, Raghava's on a rapid rise. He was already doing well before. And I think you've hit the knee of an exponential curve, Raghava. Um, Thank but you, But also God. the concept behind what you do, the not only intellectual, but also emotional comprehensiveness of how you approach things is really quite impressive and, and inspiring to me. So I'd like to share a few works, if you could comment briefly on these. Uh, this is one of your uh, earlier pieces. So uh, essentially, I was trying to retell Indian history through cartoons and memes, because I was wondering who owns the story, who owns any narrative. There is no one reality. Oh, in America, it's called Disney. They, they whatever it is, they own it. Sorry. Me, sorry. Hilarious. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, all right, uh, show us. <laughs> off to commercial. <laughs> Sorry, keep going. So, who owns so, the stories? Da da da. da. I was in, I was uh, busy producing children. I have four. I'm a very prolific uh, dad. And so, while I was having these kids, I was thinking, what kind of bias do I want to bring up my kids with? So I created new retelling of history through cartoons and memes, just to show them that history is actually extremely uh, fragmented. It's, you have to stitch a narrative. It's like looking up at the night sky and Orion is not a neatly set set of stars. It's actually, some of those stars are disappearing. Some of them don't even exist anymore. It's us who tells the story. So I wanted them to be aware of that storytelling active voice, yeah. And the name of this piece, remind me, something about the vandals, right? Yes, I think the, the real vandals are the restorers. <laughs> my, all my works are done in The real vandals are the restorers, Brief, just briefly. I, I think of people who look at art history through the uh, uh, clerks of nostalgia for a hegemony in decline. And if you look at it through the lens of this power struggle, most history is often written when a hegemony is in decline, not when they are in power. So what I found interesting was uh, the vandals are the, the ones who are trying to restore a certain hegemonic idea of how you interpret art. Great. I'm going to go to the next piece. 
Uh, this okay. one is re highly relevant, challenging, and actually Julio Otino, the dean of the McCormick School at Northwestern, used the uh, Picasso's original Guernica. Tell us a bit about your Guernica. You know, I, I was in love with Picasso's Guernica. I was a kid and I visited so often to see the Guernica. And the first thing I noticed was how goddamn large the artwork was and how I felt in front of the Guernica. I felt so small. I felt so belittled by the big message, about an anti-war message. And the more I started thinking about war, uh, ironically, this was shown in Dubai uh, exactly when the Ukraine-Russia crisis was uh, uh, starting off. And, and what I wanted to talk about is bring an Indian perspective to conflict and war. We say the war is not outside, the war is within. And so what I did was I took all the elements of philosophical influence that are conflicting within me. And, and I realized the only way to transcend this conflict, because that is me and this is me. I'm equally Indian and equally Western. I understand Kant and Hegel and, and the great grandfathers from that tradition. I also understand Indian Bollywood and, and where that emotion comes from. How do you bring it together? And I realized that what we're missing is an attitude. It's not about right or wrong. It's not about one in or out. It's about that middle space. Can you choose an attitude to conflict resolution? And if you can, I chose humor, play, pain, love as my attitude to finding a middle ground. Wonderful. Next piece is from your new work. and. Uh, this is actually an exploration of the virtual world into which we're heading. Tell us briefly about what this is. And then I have a couple other images uh, to give people a sense for what you're doing here. Okay, I'm going to try and make this quick. This was a four-year project, Rob, that started with a very deep question my brother asked me. He said, I was imagining seven years ago a 200-year plan for crypto assets, for NFTs, essentially. What would the digital encounter be? What would objects of transcendence in the digital realm look like? What are the rules of the encounter without gravity, et cetera? And at that point, I was busy making an asset class out of digital, uh, um, digital assets. And my brother asked me a question. He said, if you're going to incessantly record everything about yourself, aren't you going to try and make that a commodity as well the minute you create NFTs? Isn't every human experience going to turn into a digitizable commodity? Because if you can document it, you are going to sell it. And then he's like, where do the ethical boundaries there lie for you as a, an artist? And it was like, bam, damn, this is, I'm seeing the, the liberation. I'm seeing the loss, but I'm not looking at it from a, uh, as a, a point of view of ethical, the spiritual growth, like where do I want people? Where do, what is my imagination? And so um, I decided to document the most personal of my human experiences, my orgasm, and turned yes, it- So uh, there's an accent here. Art. That was an orgasm, just to make sure everybody got that. Um, <laughs> yes. So, yes, keep going. It was a self-induced orgasm, if you want to know details. And oh, then- Thank you. <laughs> We, Interesting we in the TMI, fact that it was ironic. TMI. But, so, but while you were doing that, and I'm going to advance the slide, Raghava, so people get a sense. While you were doing that, uh, you were being tracked, okay? Yes. And by the way, Raghava was not only being tracked when he's, you know, doing the deed, but also when he was painting or when you were having other kinds of experiences. So and I had a hundred volunteers. So we created this brain device that measures 67 channels of brain data. I wanted 69, but we, we couldn't get there. But, and then uh, we had, uh, this is a, a neuroscientist over there, uh, one, a genius kid who built this device and studied my activities while I was painting, I was uh, creating music. We wanted to distinguish noise from signal. This was, uh, again, a many, many year project. If you can advance the slide, I can show you. Uh... Oh, okay, we moved uh, a couple of steps ahead. So what we did is once we, we got that brain data, we got a bunch of, uh, we took that data and visualized it on Blender. 
Then I worked with robots from Art Matter to turn those digital works into physical works. The process involved AI, data collection, we had to do, uh, when we collected our data set, we were making sure that we had every sociological from, from sex workers to, we couldn't go to kids, of course, so don't worry, but with anyone over 21, uh, we had a very wide, uh, uh, sort of we had Indians, Americans, I've done this all over the world so that my data set was crazy. And then we trained an AI how to have these intimate moments. And what you're seeing in front of you are the world's first images of AI, uh, a cyborg orgasm, essentially. And so just to show the breadth of the project, uh, not only are you, are you doing this, but as I said, you're also exploring other kinds of experiences and that's, these are becoming these pieces of visual art that you're creating with the computational systems. But uh, there's actually another implication behind this. You're creating these physical or digital both pieces of digital. art. But you also have another message that you're exploring here, which has to do with, you mentioned, the commodification of human experiences. And in the further future, what do you see potentially coming? I'm actually putting together... <laughs> Sorry. Rob, that is on you. That's on you. Yes. Oh, let's just drop it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're having too much fun on this stage. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, but but this commodification of human experiences of all types. Tell us briefly about that. So I, I'll tell you about this project. This is a bigger project. We have three stores. The first store is the empathy store, where you can go and buy empathy if you just don't have the time to experience it. You're going to be able to buy the API, and I'm predicting not too far off in the future, you're going to wear a helmet that will that has the triangulation of your, it knows exactly what to spark when, and you're going to experience someone else's experience, human experience. You're going to actually experience it. You know, when you look at a painting, photons are hitting your eye, you interpret it, there's this whole process before you experience anything emotionally. Right. When you take, uh, when you pop uh, a drug, what's happening is it's chemically induced uh, aesthetic experience. But in this case, this is going to be directly infused into your brain. So you're literally, I can, I can go have sex with the most awesome human being in the world and sell it to you for you to or experience. have any other kind of experience for that matter. And, and by the way, Raghavi, Pain. yesterday, uh, Marlon Cerf was talking about, and many of us were talking about brain computer interfaces or what we might call invisible interfaces. And eventually there's no law of physics standing in the way of therefore us having this direct connection to brains, between brains, between systems and brains and systems and systems. And then the commodification of these visceral experiences that can be bought and sold. We're not saying good or bad. I don't think you're saying good or bad, but there's certainly a brave new world, so to speak. I think this Rock, is where attitude Rock, matters. Um, we're running out of time, uh, I regret Absolutely. to say, but I'd like to ask you for three words to describe how you feel about the future. And don't explain them. Three words to describe how Raghava KK right now feels about the future? No fucking clue. <laughs> so it turns out, everyone, that the best story that Raghava KK can tell is, I have no fucking idea. <laughs> Me but it's a beautiful ride. Here that you can feel, and I think we all feel that Jiba, or we wouldn't be sitting here. The lost liberation and mystery we're seeking, and maybe we're missing an attitude to come together more effectively in the world. Uh, Raghava, thank you so much. Thank you, Rob. It's always a pleasure. Thank you, guys.